I kept my eyes closed, holding to the peace of rest just a little while longer. I was alive, and I felt uninjured. Even my headaches had gone away. I wanted to stay like that, just for a little while longer. Because waking up meant returning to my life, and that meant pain. It also meant friends. I had no desire to stay asleep forever, just a little while longer. A few minutes. That's all I wanted. The noises around me were strange. Gravelly voices, the clopping of hoofsteps, and the high-pitched whine that had been ever-present throughout my childhood. The alicorns had set a trap, a scarily clever one, and I had fallen into the reflecting pool. The alicorns had observed how I dealt with traps by using my telekinesis, and this time, they had not only anticipated it, but used it against me with a trap that attacked me faster than my magic. The realization was terrifying. I had no idea why it didn't work. They should have killed us all. My eyes opened to the familiar sight of the stable clinic ceiling. Wait. What? Welcome to Stable City, rumbled the voice of a stallion standing nearby. His eyes glowed as his rotted body shambled towards me. The filthy even evening cloak on his back having melted into his skin. I looked around. The architecture hit the familiar stable notes, but every pony around me was a canterlock ghoul. The ghoul stallion stomped, drawing my attention. Now, we have treated your friends and you. Consider that on the house for the show your party put on yesterday. We in Stable City are willing to extend the benefit of the doubt to any pony who those monsters hate so much. He reached up a fetid hoof and tapped my horn, warningly. I could see he wore a pit buck. It was melted to his flesh like mine, only his had a broadcaster attached, one that had mercifully been turned off. But only so far, the broadcasters out in the foyer keep those monsters outside. Most of us have taken to wearing them as well in case we need to step out. I saw my eyes widen. Don't worry. None of them, none of us keep them on while we're inside. The static is highly annoying, unless we are on guard patrol, or unless you give us a reason to. One wrong step, and every citizen of Stable City becomes walking death to you living folk. So you and your brethren friends behave now. Clear? I nodded. Very clear. Now, I believe there is someone who has been waiting. The ghoul stallion began, only to be cut off by the sound of a squeal from Velvet Remedy somewhere nearby. Ah, it seems to have found your other unicorn friend first. The ghoul concluded, but I had already jumped down and was racing through the clinic, dodging between ghouls. I had slid to a stop as I spotted Velvet, then trotted forward, feeling a warm smile break across my muzzle. She was sitting up in a medical bed, her face full of joy, with pyrelight dancing gleefully through the air around her. Good day, gentle ghouls of Stable City, you miserable rotting slabs of ambulatory meat. The floating robot called out, greeting random citizens of Stable City as they passed out in the hall. Climbing to walk beside me, having found the hallway of the stable too confining to fly in, the ghouls gave us odd and curious looks as they passed. Lil Pip, you lost part of yourself, Calamity was saying. I looked down at my pit buck, his foreleg, and a pained frown immediately swept over my muzzle. I found myself to smile, much like had something added, actually. Don't go using specific details to muddy the issue, Calamity warned. The truth is, a loss like that pains a pony. And I'm not talking about just physically. And it ain't brave to pretend you ain't hurting. It ain't smart, neither. I stayed silent. When Velvet Remedy lost her leg, Calamity recalled, she was a right mess, even after she got it back. Sorry, Calamity. I chuckled wearily. 
but I don't think I'll be indulging in the same therapy. Don't be a manticore's backside, Lil Pip, Clement said crossly. When we get out of here, you need to go back to Ten Pony Tower, and you'll need to spend... No, I barked, looking at Calamity. His wings up and eyes wide, clearly taken aback by my abruptness and the strength of my refusal. More pleasantly, I complained. We've become experts at not getting what we need to get done. After Canterlot, we go right to Splendid Valley. No more delays, no more side quests, no more distractions. We get the damn god, the damn job done. Clement didn't speak for a while. In the background, I could hear the robot saying, Hello, ma'am. I do hope the morning finds you in good health. As if that could ever happen. We rounded the corner and found ourselves looking at the stable atrium. The place had been renovated to hold a pantheon of shops and small stands where Cantalot ghouls traded goods and services for bits and wares. As we started downstairs, Calamity stopped and asked me softly, Are you okay, little pip? It was a stupid question, considering the conversation immediately prior. But I ignored that, as I heard the concern in his voice. I'm weary, Calamity. I'm getting worn out. I had admitted dourly. I need this job to be over. To get out from under this threat. This mission. I looked up, scanning the stable marketplace. And then, after that, I can rest. Maybe when this is over, I'll just lay down and take a nap for a century or few, but not before. We reached the bottom of the steps. The place looked like a right lively little necropolis. The only thing that struck me as missing was any sort of dinner or foodstuff vendors. I suppose ghouls didn't really need those. I was suddenly keenly aware of how hungry I was and how long it had been since I'd eaten. How about you? I asked in return as we approached a store labeled Caliber's Guns and Ammo. Me? I'm doing... He paused as I turned to him and pointedly raised an eyebrow. Taint fair, throwing my own words back at me. I didn't say anything. He neighed. Then brushing his brow underneath his desperado hat, he admitted, I'm not doing so good, actually. I keep thinking about those bandits back in Arbru, and the ponies up at Buckland Cross. He frowned. Now, the bandits I can rightly live with. According to the old man, half of them came from Arbru, but they were still bandits. They were still ambushing the merchant. He looked at me. I know y'all been thinking, or y'all thinking being a bandit is a downright noble step up from being what the town folk of Arbru are. But from my perspective, the moment those folk in Arbury started killing folk for their meat, they were no better than bandits. I nodded. My own feelings were considerably different, but my horrific actions in Arbru voided any validation those feelings could have had. But Buckland Cross? That's another matter. Calamity shook his head, nickering bitterly. We went there demanding something and then end up killing him for it. That, my jaw dropped. Calamity, that's not how it went down at all. We tried to negotiate. They fired first. We were trying to get something they didn't need to give to ponies who were suffering without it. We had something to trade, and we're trying. They risked their elders' lives. We, we weren't raiders. Ain't it? He asked me. Clearly unsure. Ain't it just a little how that went down? I stomped, shaking my head. No. Still unconvinced, Clemente stepped to the door of the weapon shop. If you take from the rich and give it to the poor, you're still a raider, he said as the door slid up. No, I said firmly. You're not. A bandit, maybe, at best but not a raider, and you know better. I couldn't believe my kleptomaniac Pegasus was arguing this. Some would call you a hero. Buckling Cross had to be disturbing Calamity deeply in his thoughts to have plunged into such uncharacteristic 
and messy logic. Velvet Remedy was right, and we all needed years of therapy. Stepping into the store after him, I put a hoof on his shoulder. Then, not knowing what else I could do to help, I hugged him. Not in my shop, the little dead colt behind the store counter coughed in disgust. If you're looking for that, it's two floors up. The colt shoved missiles across the counter for calamity. One or two of those anti-armor missiles are pretty much guaranteed to take down an alicorn shield and make a very pleasant mess out of the winged bitch inside. He turned, or he looked at Calamity and what he was offering in return. Leave it to Calamity to not only retrieve all of our weapons and supplies, but go through the garbage for anything else that might be good to trade. This all will get you these five. Toss in one of those magical energy weapons, and I can give you all eight. Calamity raised an eyebrow. He was no Velvet Remedy, but he had a fair bartering crops of his own, and I could tell he was being very snookered. Three missiles don't equal a top-of-the-line magical energy weapon, not even if they're as fancy as y'all claim they are. The colt bit. Oh, but they are. One of the benefits of living in the Ministry of Wartime Technology. We have all sorts of toys you living folk haven't even heard of. I was willing to bet he was right. I was also willing to bet most of it was either in questionable prototype stages or stocked in too limited supply to sell. If these work so well against Alicorn shields, why haven't you used them against them yourselves? I asked reasonably. It had not been hard to glean that the ghouls of Stable City had been fighting the Alicorns since they started showing up in the Canterlot ruins about a decade ago. From the impression I got, the ghouls were losing, and now effectively contained in the ministry they called home. Calamity frowned. Ain't missiles ain't much use against a dozen of those winged bitches. That magic rifle on the other hoof can rack up quite a kill count over a couple years of sniping. Calamity whined. Well, then sounds to me like the rifle is worth all eight, but I'll give you it for six, and we'll call me the element of generosity. The colt made the trade, although from his expression, he'd be calling Calamity quite a few other things shortly after we left. Now, what do y'all have for rifle ammo? The colt shook his head, giving a snorting chuckle. Sorry, but I can't help you. If you want ammo, you'll have to look elsewhere. Calamity blinked, then made an exasperated act of reading the store sign. I thought the name of the store was Caliber's Guns and Ammo. How do you not have ammo? You only sell two things. Ha! <laughs> the little ghoul said dryly. My ammo's all stored in ammo vendors for safekeeping. Only the damn thing is busted, and I can't get it to dispense. So no ammo. Clamity began to smile. Oh, I'll bet I can fix that for you. For, what say... A 10% discount on ammo? I thought Velvet Remedy would have been so proud. The cold ghoul's eyes lit up, literally, as he asked, Definitely, if you're sure you can do it. Clemity laughed. With the number of times I've broken into them things to pilfer them, I reckon it might just do my karma some good to fix one up for once. He gave me a wink. Our earlier conversation still hung in the air but it was good to see Calamity in better spirits. Calamity rubbed his hoof on the colt's head. Don't worry, Uncle Calamity will have it all taken care of. He flew over the counter and trotted back towards the modified Iron Shod's ammo emporium vending machine, leaving the ghoul colt staring at him in disdainful amusement. I'm a century older than you. So, what can you tell me about this place? I asked Calamity. Cal caliber, sorry, the twelve-decade-old Cantalagul in the body of a colt as we watched Calamity work. He had half the machine taken apart already, and occasionally glanced uh, graced us with an a yip or a dagnamit. It's a gun shop, Calamity snarked. I sell guns, and usually ammo. I meant about Stable City, I clarified. We're new here. 
Caliber put on airs of false surprise. Really? You mean you haven't been the haven't been the two breathers living in Stable City that I just haven't noticed? I brushed it off, asking, How did a group of ghouls end up living in a stable? Caliber sighed, quickly giving up on deflating my desire to pester him with questions. Stable One was built to protect the princesses, the nobility, the government officials, and the higher ups of the ministries. Or, at least, that was what Stable Tech told every pony. They built Stable One into this building because apparently the top ponies of Stable Tech and the Ministry of Wartime Technology were real chummy. Yes, they were sisters. Anyway, when the Pink Cloud came, a whole bunch of ponies from all around, mostly from the castle and the other ministries, tried to gallop over to Stable One, hoping they could get in. After all, while they were safe from the Pink Cloud in any of the Ministry buildings, except possibly the Ministry of Peace, only Stable One had a long-term food supply. It was come here or starve. Of course, all those ponies had to run through the cloud to get here, and a whole lot of them didn't make it. Those who did found that the fuckers already in Stable One had closed it early. They were once again trapped in a safe haven without food, but then most of them expired overnight, having suffered just enough exposure to turn them into ghouls. They didn't need food anymore after that, so it all worked out. Karmic justice, since Stable Tech pretty much killed all the ponies in Stable One. The ghouls had already started a town inside the building by the time it opened up. When they added the resources of Stable One, the town became Stable City. I listened intently. How about you? I asked Caliber, once he thought he was done. Ugh, he groaned. Are all breathers this noisy? Nosy? Yes, I said, just because I could. Fine. I was born in Stable 3. Stable 3 was constructed underground. He looked at me expectantly, then sighed when it didn't become clear, when it became clear I didn't know how big a deal that was. You think the pink cloud out here is bad? That's nothing. You go underground, to any of the sewers or maintenance tunnels or under rails and you'll see bad. Then, being a breather, you'll die. It's solid pink down there. Down there, the pink cloud is alive and hungry. It was only a matter of time before it found its way in. That got a jump from me, followed by a look of disbelief. Of course ponies like you scoff. The Alicorn, who tried talking to us instead of attacking us, scoffed too. But, I'll tell you true, the pink cloud is alive down there. I've heard it breathing. Caliber shrugged. Then the colt rambled off in breaths. Breathless rapid seduction. Anyway, the pink cloud got me. I died. Became a ghoul. So did my parents. The pink cloud ate stable three, so we came here. Then the Alicorns came, killed my parents, now it's just me, which is fine, because I'm old enough to be your grandfather's great-grandfather. I run a gun store, I sell guns and ammo, usually. Ta-da, we've come full circle. Question time over. Calamity had stopped his work and was looking at me with a knowing expression. While Caliber wasn't looking, he mouthed, we need to talk. Uh, dragon? Yep, Calamity claimed as we trotted towards the open door of Stable One. A big, mammoth, behemoth, super old dragon. Just beyond stretched a large open area of the Ministry building, which had once been used for processing. But the ghouls had converted it into a sort of liberal arts common room. A two-pony band had started playing. One on a glass harp, the other on a glass harmonica. The music just floated in through Stable One's entrance it was beautifully haunting, crystalline, and strangely disorienting. It was the music of ghosts. How is the pink cloud a dragon? I asked, confusion overcoming my initial shock. It's not, 
exactly. Calamity struggled. It's weird, okay? Look, you know how the zebra balefire bombs work, right? They take a balefire egg and weave it into a magical mega spell. Talisman thingy. Or something. Anyway, the pink cloud mega spell was the same way. They took a bunch of these things they had used at Little Little Horn, and, best off figure, are essential lock water talismans, only for Pink Cloud. Move we'll them into a magical spell. Thingy. Okay, I said, nodding. I was fairly sure I was following what Calamity was saying better than he did. But how does that... Well, if you want to build a talisman that's going to last a long time, or at least long enough to kill someone who really is hard to put down, what do you make it out of? Oh, I had a sinking feeling in my gut. You use gemstones. I paused as we reached a water fountain. Stable one had a functioning water talisman. I tested the fountain, holding my pitbuck leg close to it, but there was no sign of contamination. I ran in a bit, but there was no hint of pink. Yep, Calamity said as I gulped down water from the fountain. It was not only true, it was not a true substitute for food, but it would do. This pink cloud, mega spell talisman, was just chuck full of gemstones. I saw where this was going. The dragon ate it, didn't he? Yep, and the dragon's a she. The dragon that guards the royal treasury, to be exact. As we reached the entryway, I paused. Observing a glowing terminal. My curiosity got the better of me. Hold up, I asked Calamity. I poked at the terminal and was surprised to find out that it had already been hacked and the information on it was freely available to anyone who was interested. That information consisted of a single audio file. I downloaded it to my foreleg. Turning back to Calamity, I commented. Okay, now the secret passage makes sense. How you figure? Well, Princess Celestia's school was obviously using baby dragons for something. They had come from somewhere. I reasoned. I think the princess had some sort of arrangement with the dragon. She got the biggest horde in Equestria. And the princess got... Well, her children. The royal treasury dragon was Mommy. Clemity nodded. Well... Seems the dragon digested the mega spell or something. It changed her, became part of her. Right now, she's asleep in the treasury, and she's snoring pink cloud. Well, fuckity fuck. Now I understood how Cantalot's pink cloud survived all centuries of week long rains, and why the cloud was so dense in underground passages. The cloud would have gotten into the secret passage, starting to eat away at its walls. And from there, it would have gone everywhere. Sewers, tunnels, you name it. She probably doesn't look a thing like a dragon anymore, neither. Climate amused. You gotta figure she's been fused to her hoard. The whole damn treasury. He kicked at the metal railing next to the steps leading out. So much for dreams of loot in the royal treasure. Just a waste. I rolled my eyes, then asked. How do you know all this anyway? Clemity turned to me. Cause while y'all were vocationing, I was stuck down in the hole with that crazy alicorn lady. Y'all just got a few minutes of her Looney Tune town. And I had that damn argument run through my head almost nonstop all night. He let out a louder wicker. I picked up a few things from all of that. A sign hanging on the wall next to the stable's gear-shaped ma read, Artistic Commons. No broadcasters, please. We stepped through the open, gear-shaped door and paused, hearing the music more fully now. I felt the urge to move aside somewhere, lay down, forget about the dragons and necromantic clouds and everything else. I just listen as the eternal tones moved strangely through my soul. Clemmy and I were still in the artistic commons, lulled by the music, when Steelhoose found us. 
The armor-clad ghoul trotted up, heavily, stopping for us just long enough to demand, Come with me. He was trotting back through the crowd of Cantalot ghouls, before I even fully registered his presence. I struggled to my hooves, feeling sluggish, relaxed, and strangely off-balanced. Clemity stretched out his wings, giving a few lazy flaps before lifting himself into the air. The ceiling of the processing area was three ponies high, giving him just enough room to maneuver between the uh, maze of ghouls, easels, and displays below, and the light fixtures above. His hooves kept a brisk pace, weaving dispassionately between the residents of Stable City. I had to wonder what this was like for him. He had anticipated nothing but poison, death, and monsters in the Canterlot Ruins. And while those existed in great abundance, he had also found a pocket of civilization, a community composed of Canterlot ghouls, like himself. As we started climbing one of the several flights of stairs, my stomach rumbled, again protesting my lack of proper breakfast or lunch. I distracted myself by putting in my ear bloom and playing the audio recording I'd found in the Stable One Terminal. The voice was familiar, which made the beginning of the recording all the more jarring. There was wetness in her voice. She had clearly been crying, but no more. Now, while the bitterness and sorrow remained, the hurt was gone, and cold anger had nestled in his place. Hello, and goodbye. My name is Scootaloo, and you probably know me as Vice President of Stable Tech, the company who designed and built the stable you take refuge in now. But right now, I'm talking to you as one of the very, very many ponies you fuckers have murdered. You, the Ministries, the Heads of Equestria, the Princesses, if you're in here. You killed us all with your stupid, senseless war, and now, I'm returning the favor. I'll admit, I gave a lot of serious thought to just keeping the door of Stable One from sealing properly and letting you all die from whatever horror you hid yourselves from, while the rest of Canterlot's ponies and all the rest of Equestria perished. All... all the ponies we were unable to save. But, that's the whole point of the stables. Above and beyond everything else, the stables are meant to save people. Yes, people. I'm happy to report that one of the stables has been built to save as many Equestrian zebras as possible. The ones that you fuckers shoved into a dump and tried to forget about. And Stable 14 is currently housing many of Equestria's griffins. But the stables were mostly built to save ponies, even ponies like you. It is for that reason alone that you're going to live out the rest of your natural lives in Stable 1, as will your children, regardless of the conditions existing outside. I have seen to it that Stable 1 will not open so long as even one of you is still alive, which, if the princesses are in there, might not be for a very long time. No matter how fast Equestria heals, not a single damn one of you is going to get to profit from what you have done. Equestria is something you ponies don't deserve. I hope your souls rot for eternity. Steelhooves led us to the border of Stable City, a once rather drearily officious room labeled Ministry of Wartime Technologies. Subsidy Application Center, which had been converted into a defense position, complete with turrets, armored wall reinforcements, and barricades with murder holes, into a door that had been canvassed with welded armored plates. Steelhoof stopped, raising an armored forehoof and banging against the door in four impatient raps. He waited a moment, nickered softly to himself. Steelhoofs, What's this all about? I asked, disquieted by the mood radiating from him. I noticed he was carrying a saddle satchel that he had never worn before. He didn't answer, still nickering. Just as I began to suspect he was counting, he stopped. Steelers opened the armored door and barged inside, passing a displeased looking Cantalot ghoul who stood guard. Calamity and I followed. I waved to the guard as we passed, observing his battle saddle, armor, and the pit buckle around his leg. His broadcaster was turned off. I quickly realized this was the purpose of Steelhoof's knock. 
The guard did not return my greeting. Feeling a wave of depression, I noticed his pit buck was not part of him. I suspected most of the pit bucks worn by the ghouls of Stable City had been acquired from Stable One or the residents therein. Without the right tools and knowledge, it was impossible to open a pit buck or lock it onto a new body. However, the pit buck technician stall in Stable One should have had both the tools and the documentation the Candlelock ghouls needed. I tried to buck up. Feeling morsely about my leg wasn't going to help me anything. The emotion didn't even make sense. As we moved forward, I found myself staring out at the wall of pink. We had exited on an upper area overlooking the atrium. Dim, pink-tinted light flooded the once grand atrium. The cloud was thick enough outside that we would need to drink healing potions after making a run between the ministry buildings now. Down below, we could hear the sea of static from dozens of broadcasters hidden amongst the skeletons that littered the floor. But we were high enough to be out of danger. Feeling a flood of deja vu, I moved up to the railing and looked down. I had been here before. From this very spot, I had looked down to a much sunnier lobby as Applejack spoke openly with her old zebra friend, Zakora. I had watched, and my host had plotted Applejack's demise. I shot away from the railing with a shudder of disgust. Steelers were looking back at me with several yards ahead. This way. The place our Applejack's ranger led us to was an odd little alcove underneath a sweeping stairwell. The door had long ago been removed and a simple stained curtain hung in its place. Warm light poured out from underneath the hanging drapery as well as above it and along the sides. Clemity knocked on the wall beside the curtain, this time almost reverently. Star, he grumbled, it's Apple Snack. I've returned with as many of the things as you asked that I could find, and I've brought my friends. Although I hadn't counted Steelhoos amongst my friends for weeks, to hear him refer to us this way was surprising, strange, and poignant. Oh, bless you, the elderly mare's voice rasped from inside, followed by an odd squeaking. Please, step inside. Steelhoos pushed past the curtain without hesitation. With a mixture of caution and wonder, I stepped in behind him. The room under the stairs was small, lit by a couple of spark of cola lamps, sitting on old medical boxes. There was a clean-looking toilet in the near corner, with several pristine coffee mugs sitting on it, a few shelves. The back half of the room was sectioned off by a once beautiful hanging curtain, originally of rich hues and scarlets and purples, but now faded and fraying. Much of the wall directly opposite the doorway had taken up a rusty ventilation grate. The fan behind it was slowly turning. The only other notable furniture amongst the clutter was an ancient phonograph sitting, inside, uh, sitting beside a player for more modern audio recordings. I immediately pictured this room as having originally been a little getaway place for some janitor or maintenance pony, a place you could sneak off to, to smoke, relieve yourself, or other things. Living in this scheduled and somewhat sad place outside of Stable City, yet still inside the ministry building itself, was a mayor who was elderly even before the pink cloud made her undying. She was a unicorn. Her body fused to this wheelchair, to which she had been largely confined even before. My first assumption upon seeing the curtain was that the next room held a mattress. But now I realize that not only did Cantalock ghouls not sleep, but this mare had not even been able to lay down and rest. She greeted us with a smile, her eyes wide and glowing. Thank you, Apple Snack. She beamed at us. It's been so long since I've had visitors. Steelhoose set the saddle satchel on the floor. I'm sorry, I couldn't 
find everything, Star. The violet light manifested around the unicorn ghoul's horn and developed the satchel. Oh, this is lovely, Star said, floating out several records and a few audio recordings. You have saved this old mare, Apple Snack. Truly, you have. Books later hit it out next. I was going to go insane if I had to read the same old dusty books one more time. She gasped as she pulled out a few boxes of old snack cakes. Oh, how thoughtful! The elderly ghoul's smile was somehow beautiful, despite the condition of her decayed and warped body. I may not need to eat, but it is so wonderful to occasionally taste sweetness. I looked at Steel Hooves. His stance was almost bashful. I could almost feel the warmth radiating, radiating off the normally dour and stoic ghoul. The elderly mare paused. A ghost of a tremble passing through her lower lip. She swiveled away, turning the wheels of her chair with her magic. Likewise, magically tugging at the curtain to dab at her left eye. The chair squeaked as she rotated. I noticed that the larger wheels were still functioning, but their smaller ones had fused rigid. The moment the curtains revealed the wall behind was plastered with posters and images. I couldn't make out any of them, save for the lavender seemed the lavender seemed to be dominated the dominating color. And one of the posters read or had the word read. As the curtain fell back into place, I realized two things. First, I had no idea why the old ghoul had emotionally reacted to what my mind had labeled a shopping run. And second, she had been able to wipe her away her tear with a hoof because her forelegs were melted to the leg rests of her chair. I felt an involuntary shudder, trying to imagine living forever, unable to move. I immediately wanted to help this poor mare, and I felt very proud of Steel Hooves. But where are my manners? Star asked abruptly, turning back with a big smile on her face as she floated the contents of the satchel away. And where are yours? She said without a hint of malice. You haven't introduced your friends. Steel Hooves whined, then turned back to look at us. Calamity had been staring at him, with eyebrows raised so high they nearly punched off his hat. But now he broke into an almost sly grin. Yeah, Apple Snack, why don't y'all introduce us and quit hogging this pretty young gal for yourself? Clement shot stare a warm smile with a mythful wink. She rolled her eyes, smiling. Star, this is little Pip, he said, nodding to me, and the Pegasus is Calamity. Little Pip, Calamity, this is Star Sparkle. Howdy, Miss Sparkle, Calamity said. My smile of greeting faltered a moment. Wait, who? She's living here, outside Stable City, because she's been shunned, Stilu said, his voice carrying an edge. I blinked. Candelot ghouls needed neither food nor clothing, and the Ministry helped provided shelter, whether in Stable City or not. But I had learned that ponies needed more than those things. Ponies needed companionship and some sort of social framework, and that is what Stable City provided them. As much as water, ponies thirst for friendship. In Shunning Star, the ghouls of Stable City had taken from her the one thing they could, the one thing she probably needed most. Because the ghouls of Stable City believe her daughter created the Alicorns. Was always proud of my daughter, Star Sparkle told us, firmly, as she magically drew back the curtain which bisected her humble living space. And nothing that those monsters outside have done will ever change that. Twilight Sparkle was behind the curtain. Every inch of the wall space was covered in images of her. Everything from ministry posters to ancient and yellowed home photographs, all of which seemed to be of Twilight as a young filly. There were open scrapbooks of newspaper articles featuring Star Sparkle's daughter, a large oil painting and a smiling twilight sparkle hung in a de decorative oval frame in the center of the back wall. 
Ministry Mayor Twilight Sparkle. Um, to word. Filled small shelves and crates. And in the center was a precious Twilight Sparkle statuette. Her base reading a familiar Be Smart. Golly, Calamity breathed. But when the Alicorn started appearing in Canterlot, and they began to kill us, the other ponies of Stable City decided I was no longer welcome among them. Star Sparkle explained sorrowfully. They said I posed a danger to the city. The Alicorns have never paid me any unusual attention, but she looked away. Well, maybe they're right. Sounds to me more like they were looking for some pony to take it out on, Calamity grumbled. Star gave Calamity an aching smile. Please, don't judge them too harshly. After all, they have allowed me to stay living in the building. I've never been harassed. Maybe once a year some pony will even bring me things. She smiled warmingly at Steel Hooves. Like Apple Snack here. Such a sweet young buck. You deserve better, Steel Hooves asserted. My heart echoed that sentiment, filling with an aching sadness. But the little pony in my head found the scene in front of me, more than a little creepy. Standing beside her daughter in the face of public persecution was admirable, but what I saw before me was more than a shrine. It felt like I was looking into the face of obsession. Star Sparkle seemed to read something in my expression, or body language. Your friend thinks I'm crazy, she, stole, uh, she told Steel Hooves. I opened my muzzle to protest. Don't fret, dear, she told me kindly. I understand. It looks like a lot when all of it is in such a small place. I shut my muzzle, sharing a glance with Calamity, before lowering my head in an apologetic expression that was not entirely sincere. This would seem excessive, even if spread over multiple rooms twice this size. Star Sparkle let out a sigh, looking over Twilight Sparkle's shrine. No, you're right. But it's not what you think. She bit her lower lip, closed her eyes. I love my daughter, more than life itself, as did my husband. She opened her eyes, looking at the oval oil painting. And I admired her, the princess's favorite pupil, the bearer of one of the elements of harmony, the mayor of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. I was so proud. I heard a tremble in her voice. Her gaze lowered to the floor. But I was afraid of her too, Star Sparkle admitted slowly. We both were, although my husband less than I. And just once, when she was very young, she lost control. She changed me into a potted plant, entirely by accident. But if it hadn't been for the princess, the mayor who had given birth to Twilight Sparkle looked up at me. Her eyes again damp with tears. I know I shouldn't have been, but I was frightened. And even though I never stopped loving her, I let myself grow distant. She frowned. Some mother. My daughter received more correspondence from the princess herself than she did from me. I never visited her all the time she was in Ponyville. I never met her friends. She shook her head. She never forgot us, though. When they built Stable 1, my Twilight made sure my husband and I were amongst the first to be guaranteed a safe place inside. We were on the way there when the cloud overtook us. My husband died on the steps just outside the Ministry, making sure I made it through the door. She looked away, softly muttering. Of course, they'd sealed the stable early. I found myself looking at a wheelchair and thinking of the stallion skeleton outside with his hooves sunk into the concrete. I was suddenly very angry at the ponies of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. How dare they seal up the stable, trapping good ponies outside, families, and loved ones of the stable. What's supposed to save? They deserved, well, what they got. I suppose I've been trying to make up for all the distance I let fall between us but my daughter was still alive. I looked at the shrine with fresh eyes. This wasn't obsession. It was overcompensation. 
I've come in here. I talk and talk to her. Star Sparkle told us. Sometimes I tell her how my day was, although not so much anymore, since all my days are pretty much the same. Sometimes I read to her. She did love books. Star smiled sadly. Sometimes I just tell her I'm sorry, and that I love her. She looked away, a few tears escaping to drip from her cheeks. Sometimes, she admitted softly, I even think that I hear her say something back. We are taking her with us, Stilu stomped. We were standing in the mezzanines as we waited for Velvet Remedy and Pirate to join us. We are not taking her with us, I stomped back. She deserves better than that, Shields insisted, pointing his hoof in the direction of Star Sparkle's hovel. She doesn't deserve to face, but we have to, I argued, shaking my head. Where we're going next is too dangerous. I was cut off by a majestic hoot as Pyrolite landed on my head, her talons pricking at my scalp through my mane. I turned to see Velvet Remedy trotting up, a rather large pack hovering behind her. Steelhoof snickered angrily. Well, of course you're not taking her with us now. The Alicorns will be waiting outside for us. I'm not trying to get her killed. I'm out of something to help with that, Calamity interrupted, pulling the case of new missiles out of his pack and setting it before Steelhoofs. Oh, Velvet Remedy sang. We're giving presents? Perfect, because I have one for little Pip. I blinked. A present? For me? She floated the package over to me as she joined us. I just had to get you something new to wear, she chimed, especially after throwing your dress to the dragons. I tried not to grimace. Of all the things I was worried about right now, a pretty dress was not really among them. I had rather given up on pretty dresses. The equestrian wasteland favored me more rugged and armored look. Still, maybe it would be something to look nice in for homage. But then I opened the package. I found that Velvet Remedy had surprised me. Canterlot Police Barding, Velvet Remedy told me as I pulled out the old uniform. It was in amazing condition. Some of the best light barding in Equestria, she whined threat word. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to find anything practically in pra practical in your size. Wow. I... I blinked. It was a wonderful gift, yet at the same time, I'd grown rather attached to my armored stable utility barding. Although, thankfully, not literally and permanently. Didsy Do had armored it, after all. Both remedies seemed prodding. Go ahead, put it on. Almost as if she had read my mind, Velvet said, I know your old stable suit has been a constant companion, but haven't you put it through enough? That suit has been torn up and mended as often as you have, and deserves a rest. Wouldn't you agree? I nodded solemnly, and started to disrobe. We're still not taking her with us, I said firmly. Taking who? Velvet asked. Star Sparkle, Steelhoofs told her. Who? Take her where? Calamity asked. Ten Pony Tower, Steelhoofs said emphatically. Do you really think they'll just let her in? A cantalot ghoul? Live in such a posh, stuck up? Yes, they will. Steelhoofs slowly intoned in a low voice that told me it would be very bad for the citizens of Ten Pony Tower to refuse her. She was Twilight Sparkle's mother. Remember what Ten Pony Tower is. They will. I nodded. I agree. I started. Suspecting that Twilight Society would go to great lengths to have a direct relative of the Ministry Mayor in the Tower. And I'm sure that homage would help. And, I chuckled, shaking my head. I can set it up with a place. I own a cheese shop. Both Clavity and Velvet Remedy looked at me oddly. Yeah, what now? As I pulled the stable barding suit over my head, I informed Steelhooves. But we're not taking her with us. 
I tossed my stable utility barding onto the floor and stared at it. It was ragged. So patched up, it looked like it was sewn from rags. There were deep stains, not all of which were blood. It was repulsive. Not now. I looked at Steel Hooves, who was still snorting impatiently. We'll come back and get her, though. I promise. Until then, she's safe here. Why not? Steel Hooves said insistently. Because we're not going to Tempony Tower. As soon as we're done in Canterlot, we're going straight to Splendid Valley. No more delays. After we pick up Zenith, Clamity reminded me. Okay, one delay. After we pick up Zenith, I added, Splendid Valley. I leveled a look at Steel Hooves. You know what's there. I'm not taking Twilight Sparkle's mother anywhere near that place. And I'm not taking her anywhere near the goddess. Or anywhere until the goddess has been dealt with. Steel Hooves seemed to accept that answer, backing down with a nod. I folded the barding up as best I could and slipped it into my duffel bag, filled with tools for calamity. Oh! I looked up, floating my old armor and the stealth buck too out of the old duffel bag, before passing it to calamity. I've got a present for you too! Calamity took one look inside and let out a whiny squeal of glee. I started putting on the canterlot police barding, which really did quit, uh, fit quite well. And, oh, what was that I was feeling? Oh yes, I remember now. This was the feeling of wearing something clean. Steelers walked over to the nearest stable city guard and spoke with him, getting a nod. I trotted in place, getting used to the feeling of the new armored barding. Thank you, Velvet. This is nice. I paused, noting the color. How does it look? Does it go with my mane? Steelers neighed, returning as the guard trotted over to the railing of the mezzanine. Honest opinion? I can't picture it on you. Not enough bloodstains. I gave Steelhooves a dirty look. Give her time. I shifted my attention to the guard, ignoring them both. The guard's horn began to glow. Sparks of magical light floated down and spread across the skeleton on the floor. The static from beneath us stopped. How? I shut them off, the guard said simply. I'll turn the broadcasters back on after you leave. Shut them off? My hoof slapped my face as I remembered cowering in the corner of the Ministry of Magic lab, shooting frantically at a broadcaster. Of course, you can just switch them off. I was not a clever pony. In fact, I was a very stupid pony. As we walked down the steps and made our way to the Sea of Bones, I stopped and pulled one of the broadcasters from its pit buck, turning it over, familiarizing myself with its design. Well, ain't this obviously an ambush, Clemmy said dryly, looking out into the pink. Where do you think they all went? There was no sign outside of even a single olicorn. Hadn't up on the roof or around the side of a building? Maybe the one they call Nightseer got tired of losing alicorns to us and called them back, Valdormi suggested, hopefully. Something in the tone of her voice betrayed that she didn't really think that was possible either. So, Calamity looked to me. What's the plan? The Balloon Orb. Pinkie Pie's office. Ministry of Morale. Manhattan. Only not. As I pushed open the door with a pink hoof, everything seemed off, distorted. It was as if the normal color scheme of the world had become a twisted painting of grotesque pastels. I felt awful, and yet I felt horribly alive. A buzz ran through my nerves and up my spine. My ears twitched. There was a tremor in the back of my right hind leg, and an odd burning sensation was growing in my left fore hoof. I knew this feeling. My host was riding the razor cliff of a party time Mintal's high. The edge before the awful crash. But it was more than that. This was... wrong. 
The world tasted funny, smelled funny, like peppermint and rotted cabbage. Stupid bitchy witchy twilight, I'm fine, I'll show her. My host looked around, scowling. It was as if she realized something was terribly out of place, but couldn't put her hoof on what. I know, I'll record my memory and send it to her. A nice, long one. She'll see there's nothing wrong with me. And she won't be able to leave until she's done seeing. No. No, Pinky. You are not fine. Nothing about this is fine. Pfft. <laughs> leave her be. The voice from behind me. If she wants you to throw... Uh, if she wants to throw you away because she doesn't like your parties anymore, then good riddance. The voice was female, and it was coming from... The plant? Yes. One of the potted plants in Pinkie Pie's room was actually talking to her. I saw the plant move. The leaves rustle as a voice drifted up from it. You don't need her. You don't need any of them. My host barely gave her... it... a glance. I thought she was my friend. Indeed, came another voice from a marbled paperweight on Pinkie's desk. None of them see you f see what you can see. They don't understand the pressure you're under. No, Pinkie Pie agreed. No, they don't. Oh, goddesses. Pinkie Pie was having a mental break. I was seeing what she was seeing in her head. Pinkie Pie continued to look around, then stopped, staring at a tall, thin object concealed by a sheet. Where did you come from? She plotted over and grabbed the sheet with her teeth pulling it free. Before her stood a mirror. I saw my host staring back at me. Pinkie Pie, but not as I was used to seeing her. Her colt's color was off. Her mane hung straight and limp. Her expression was cross and dour. This was Pinkie Pie, right after her last party. There was a ribbon wrapped around the mirror with a note on it. Dearest Pinkie, Thought this might help you find your way. Rarity. Pinkie Pie scowled as she read the letter. I'm not lost. She gasped the ribbon in her teeth and tore it away, then stared at herself in the mirror. You too, Rarity? She mumbled. Are all my friends going to abandon me? Can't trust any pony anymore, the paperweight grumbled. Pinkie Pie trotted to a nearby intercom, pressing a hoof against a button. Hey, there's a mirror in my office that's not supposed to be here. Call somebody to pick it up. Yes, ma'am. The mayor's voice crackled over the intercom, sounding oddly distant. Where's it supposed to be? I don't care. Take it to one of the fun farms or something, Pinky grumbled. Just get rid of it. My host trotted back up to the mirror, staring. She reached out a hoof, touching the surface, and jumped back at the shock of cold. The image in the mirror changed abruptly. Now, looking back at us, was Pinkie Pie. Smiling, cheery, objectionably pink, poofy-haired Pinkie Pie. Oh, hey! The Pinkie Pie in the mirror called it happily. Hello, Pinkamina. Ooh, you don't look so good. Which is bad, because you're me. And that means I don't look so good. She had enchanted a small mirror. To look in, in it. You would see your reflection, just as with any mirror. But if you touched it, or focused your magic on it, then a spell within the mirror took a picture of your soul. Then a second enchantment allowed the mirror to show that image. The mirror Pinkie Pie looked at my host with concern. What's wrong with us? Who the hell are you? Pinkie Pie, my host, grumbled. Goddesses, this was bizarre, if not downright creepy. I decided to think of them in different names, just to keep my thoughts straight, although part of me worried that I was buying into this insanity. Why, I'm you, of course, Pinkie Pie giggled. I'm the real you, which is weird since I'm totally high too. The reflection was high on PTMs, or was that Pinkie Mina's high warping the reflection that can't really be having this conversation in the first place, since reflections can't talk like paperweights and potted plants. This is a trick, 
Pinkamina hissed. You mean like a practical joke? See, they really do still care about you. Pinkie Pie paused. They brightened. Oh, hello, little Pip. Uh, hello? The conversation had taken a left turn into Weirdsville. Little Pip says, uh, hello, Pinkie Pie proclaimed, beaming. White. What? Now Little Pip says, wait. What? Pinkie Pie giggled. This was impossible. You remind me of our friend Twilight Sparkle, Little Pip. She's not our friend, Pinkie Mina sighed. Not anymore. Pinkie Pie's eyes widened. She is so our friend. If she wasn't, she wouldn't be trying to help us. Pinkie Mina opened her mouth. But Pinkie Pie shook her head. And don't try telling yourself you don't need help. I know better. And that means you know better. I... I'm just trying to make ponies happy. Make them happy? Little Pip has a point, Pinkie Pie said seriously. You can't make some pony happy. You can only help them to find happiness. Pinkie Pie pointed out the window. Look out there. Do they look happy? No, Pinkie Mina mumbled, looking any place but the window. They're not happy, Pinkie Pie admitted sadly. I think... I think they're actually scared of us. This was... This was what led to Pinkie Pie realizing she needed help. This conversation that somehow, insanely, I was part of, was what pushed Pinkie to... Shh! Pinkie Pie scowled at me from the mirror. You have to keep secrets, little Pip. What? No, if, if there was any chance I was somehow communicating, then there were things that Pinkie Pie needed to know. I could warn her. I could save... Not listening, Pinkie Pie said, covering her ears. You can't tell, little Pip. But, but everything ends so horribly. No, no it doesn't. Pinkie Pie shook her head feverently. Then, suddenly... She was smiling again. Everything will end in sunshine and rainbows, she announced gleefully. I was struck by the strangest sense of deja vu. She pointed a hoof at me. Or was it Pinkamina? As long as you're willing to face the fire, that is. What fire? Pinkamina asked. Don't listen to her, the potted plant insisted. She just wants you to fail. No, Pinkie Pie insisted. We have to do what is most important first. We have to save other ponies before we can save ourselves. You know what I mean. With those bad, bad ponies at four stars. But then, Pinkie Pie smiled sadly. Then, we do have to save us, don't we? Sunshine and rainbows. I wanted to tell her how absolutely impossible that was. Hell, the two things this world didn't have anymore were... Pinkie Pie grew very cross glaring at me through the mirror, sunshine, and rainbows. Pinkamina dropped to the carpet. We, I, she began to cry. How? How can I fix this? How can I giggle at the ghosty when I'm the ghosty? If a hug could heal pain, then laughter could heal fear. But the ministries cast a big shadow. There were many, many ponies who needed a giggle. We need to stop, Pinkie Pie said solemnly. The whole Ministry of Morale isn't helping. It's hurting ponies. And we need to stop. We need to get clean. Then record this memory for little Pip. Then... The whole Ministry, Pinkamina moaned. We need to tear it all down. A big going-away party. The biggest ever.